Okay. All right. Today we got in the house standing at six foot three inches tall. No, this is this is my younger brother. If you didn't know, this is my younger brother Jake. We are separated by about eighteen months, and uh, they've been uh, down in Arkansas with his wife Sheena, and now five kids, all Arkansan kids now. Uh, since they got married, which is like almost eighteen, a lot of years, a lot of years ago. So anyway, let's give him a hand. All right, thank you. Pastor Nate. Seriously, thank you. And I just want to say thank you for opening the pulpit to allow me to minister. I don't take it lightly. In fact, I don't really enjoy the preparation process, if we're being honest. But it is a, it's an honor, and I know uh, you don't hold this pulpit lightly. This is, this is a, a massive honor. So um, thanks for coming to midweek service. I'm so glad you guys are here tonight. If I could say a few prelims, I would just, um, I just want to comment on this house real quick. And uh, this, this house is just rich with honor, and it's because of the leadership that we have here, Pastors Nate and Evan. They, they have worked very hard and prayed very hard and prayed uh, relentlessly that this would be a place that honors him. And it's rare my wife and I, we got to visit a couple of churches recently in the last few months, and it's rare to have the type of honor that we have in this house. And when you are here and you work here, you really don't just go to other churches ever, right, Landon? I mean, like, you just don't go to other churches. So you, you sometimes lose sight of how blessed you really are. And amen, Rod. And it's, anyway, it's just and honestly, our hope is that where the Lord is calling us, that that's, that's one of the, the purposes of his calling, is that we can, what we've experienced here and the honor that we've seen and the, the culture of honor, that somehow God will allow us to, to help with that, where we're headed. And um, I'm kind of tired of talking about us transitioning and all that stuff because it's, I'm just over it because I'm like, I feel like I'd rather just talk about how awesome everyone is, all of y'all, and not like that we're leaving because it's not like, you know, it hurts us to leave, hurts us more than it hurts y'all, I promise you that, because the way I describe it is we're losing 99%, y'all are losing 1%, so there you go. Anyway, um, but let's, let's talk about the word. So as I said, like, I always say this when I minister, I don't know why, but I just, I guess I feel the need to. Uh, Pastor Nate, correct anything afterwards that I mess up. And y'all, go read your Bibles if something makes your head tilt, okay? Go read it and find out that Jake was wrong or said it wrong or whatever. But ultimately, trust the Holy Spirit to speak to you tonight because I'm trusting him to speak through me. And I've got some papers with some keystrokes that, um, anyway, that I believe God's just going to speak through. Okay, so um, I want to pay tribute to my math teacher from high school for the following. Uh, in homeroom in our senior year, he, he led us in a memorization of James 1, 2 through 8, and that's kind of the, the context for tonight's verses. And so if you want to follow along on the, on the screens, you can, but my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith will produce patience. But let patience have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. But let patience have its perfect work. And as I pause to find my words, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all, and it will be given, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith with nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed like a salad. That's what we always added as students. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. 
We're going to talk about that tonight. Because could I, if I, if, you don't have to raise your hand or whatever, but could I ask by a show of hands, how many of you would say that you are maybe in a season where those first couple of verses kind of apply, like you are going through some trials of some kind, or your faith is being tested, if you will. Anyone? Okay. Several hands. And so let's talk about it, because guess what? It's a joyful thing, and that's what we just read. We get to count it joyful, literally joyful, and that's what we're going to talk about, because uh, it's just what the Lord wants to talk about. So there you go. In the year 2007, my wife and I, uh, we were impregnated, impregnated. (laughs) Sheena got pregnant, (laughs) and that was our first, of which we would later find out to be five total, and so we were young, we had no idea about like healthcare and all this kind of stuff, so we got pregnant, it's like, oh, we're going to need healthcare because, you know, babies are expensive to be born in the institution and all this stuff. And so this was one of our first, like, remember when God, okay? This was one of our first. And we were pregnant with no health care. And so we wrote a letter to Arkansas Blue Cross and basically said, you know, here's our story. We're asking for uh, insurance. And, um, and so this was like a God step, you know? But Here we are, like our faith is being tested. We're in a trial. Like I'm probably making like $13 an hour or maybe seven. I don't know what I was making. Not much money. (laughs) Sheena isn't making much money. And we just moved here and we're pregnant. And it's like, all right, real life, you know. And we got covered with insurance to the glory of God. I don't know how Arkansas Blue Cross did that or whatever. It wasn't like the... Medicaid system or whatever, it was like insurance, and they covered us, and it, that was one of our first things where it's like, look what God did. Another one, quick one, when we found out we were pregnant with our fifth, that was also a trial and a test <laughs> of sorts, because Ezra, the one right before him, was like just brand new baby, you know, and so we... Yes, we know how babies are made now, okay? <laughs> but, um, but that's sort of like just a little lighthearted story. We haven't been through massive, uh, massive crisis and massive things to look back on. One of the big ones also, one of our sons, he was, in, he was in the hospital for kidney disease for a whole week when we were on vacation to Minnesota one year, and that absolutely tried our faith. But this... This passage is it's so near to our heart for those situations and so many others, and now for the one which the last couple of years. And so when you are going through a trial, like James says, count it all joy, um, you need to know your identity. And so we're going to start with that. You need to know who you are when you enter the fight. It's funny, Pastor Nate introduced me with the standing, you know, this tall and this, this and that, because he, he began to introduce into the ring, you know, the identity. And that was sort of the vision I had for, uh, for this piece was, you know, imagine this WWF wrestling match where they hype it up before people are introduced, before the wrestlers are introduced, and uh, I don't know if they still do this, but, you know, standing, you know, this tall, weighing this many pounds, can, you know, bench press this much weight and all this stuff. And so, you know, he's coming out knowing his story, his identity, his DNA. He, the, he, he's being educated to those, you know, here's what this guy can do. Here's where he's from and all that stuff. I think it's important for us when we enter the ring to remind ourselves, hey, you're standing, you know, this tall and this, you're weighing this much. You can bench press this much. And so let's talk about some of those attributes. And so let's remember that God is a master planner. God is the architect 
of all of this, of you and me. And, and he designed you individually before you were even made. And the Bible says that you are on his mind constantly. He never sleeps and never slumbers. And he says that he's thinking about you at all times. When you wake up and when you go to sleep and the, the hairs on your head or lack thereof are numbered. So he's a master planner. And I like to think of my family. A lot of times our kids will wake up on a Saturday and say, what's the plans for today? And you know what's so cool? All they have to do is say, what are the plans? And they can either get in line with our plans <laughs> or they're going to have to get in line with our plans and it might not go as well with them. But that's not the point here. The point is, the planner. And so a lot of times I think we take the pressure and the responsibility of making our own plans, don't we? Like, you know, I have free will and sometimes I forget, you know, because God is maybe not as visible in this natural realm that he's actually the planner. And so I go about my day and I'm, I'm making my plans. And, but let's remember, God is the master planner. Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you. Isn't that comforting? He has plans. He has plans. Some of us are very good at planning. My wife is very good at planning. I love it. She manages our Google Calendar, shares everything with me, tells me when stuff is, and I still forget, like, hey, what? She's like, you're supposed to be at this meeting at this time. I'm like, thank you. She's an amazing planner. Man, but just think of God, how he knows the plans. He made plans for you. You don't have to make your own plans. I don't have to make my own plans. I don't even have to think, what do I want to plan? What's my five-year plan? What's my retirement plan? Hey, Jeremiah, what's your college plan? You don't have to. You don't have to make your plan. God says, I know the plans I have. He has plans for you, declares the Lord. Plans to what? Prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for your life. It's ultimately intended for what? For your good and for his glory. The plans for your life are intended for your good and his glory. Let's look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He created, he, he prepared in advance these good works, like the good things, like tonight, Rodney up here doing good works on the piano, just playing, and other musicians and singers, my eyes are closed, I don't remember who all, but guys, good works. And then tomorrow, uh, today's Wednesday, so tomorrow if you're working, I don't, there's good works planned for you, for you to go do. Good works. Isn't that awesome? We have a master planner. We don't even have to figure out our plans. We don't have to figure out how to do good works. Why? Because it's like I can just wake up like my kids do and say, hey, what's the plans for today? Yes. Psalm 139, 13 through 16 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Wow. That is mind-blowing. I read this to one of my very analytical sons the other night, and his head just tilted like, okay, so he knows, like, what, tomorrow? And I, and I picked up this water uh, glass that was on the dining room table, and I did this, and I set it down. And he's like, so he knew you were going to do that? I'm like, yeah. He's like, how? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> But there's comfort in knowing that his plans for me are good and to prosper me and to bring him glory. How much better can it get than that? Plans to prosper me and to bring him glory. Can it get any better? But yet, well, then why am I going through so much? Well, we'll talk about that. But that doesn't matter right now. Just know 
His plans are good. They're to prosper me and to bring him glory. And, and so he, was, he did all this like before I was even formed. And it says, um, all the days ordained were written in the book before one of them came to be. Wow. Okay, sorry. I thought I had more to that verse, but that was it. Okay. So his plan and purpose for your life was established before you were even born. Rest in that. Let's look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We all know this one, or most of us probably have this memorized because it seems like it's, it's in a lot of places. But trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. He will make your path straight. So who's going to direct your path? Who's going to make it straight? He will. It's comforting, isn't it? So all I have to do is don't lean on my own understanding. Actually, that's comforting too. Because my understanding is so limited. The longer I live, the more I realize that. And the sooner I can get my kids to understand that, the better it will be in our home. You know, when kids know more than the parents. I'm beginning that phase of life. Uh, But lean not on your own understanding. Just lean on his. Like, In other words, I can just be like space cadet. One of my kids is that way. Like he totally spaces out. He's just always chill, not a care in the world. And he's just like, what? (laughs) I love you, bro. I love you. But he has a lot of faith. And I think those two traits are interconnected because lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll show you. So where, where is the reliance in me in that, or reliance on me in that? Is it to know? No. What is it? To lean or to rely on him, right? So you are responsible for what? not making your plans or any of that stuff, but when it comes to a trial, you are responsible for your response. You are not responsible for the plan of God coming to pass in your life. You are responsible for your response. Romans 11.36 says, For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. All glory to him forever. All glory to him forever. You know, we can get sucked into this this lure of wealth, this lure of status. There's, There's a very loud lure of status right now in our society with influencers, TikTokers, YouTubers, social media influencers, people who are making money by making videos and it's funny because, like, it's a trend. It's a trend, and I'm thinking, like, that's a trend. Like, what, that, this is a trend that you're riding right now, and then what? You know, like, and, you're, and a lot of these people, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them, they're just trying to go do crazy things and film it so they can make money. And what's happening is, again, it's, it's, it's for the purpose of glory, isn't it? Like, I want glory, I want fame, I want views and clicks and likes and shares. I'm not trying to hate on popular social media. I have a YouTube channel too and whatever. I'm not hating on stuff. I'm just saying to this verse though, all glory to him forever. And so we can rest, again, we can know when we are in our journey, when we are on our path, you know, and we'll get to the trials part here in a second. But when we are going, you know, day by day, season by season, it's just a good reminder. All glory to him. God, how can I bring you glory in this? Let my life bring you glory in this. So there's other ways to see your identity when you're in the trial. And, and I like to look at, obviously, Jesus from Psalm 23 The good shepherd, let's read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. 
He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So what we see here is a relationship. This is a description. This is so much more than this, so I don't mean to oversimplify it, and I don't want to do that. But I, one point I want to take out of it is the shepherd. And so when I am, when I am being, when my faith is being stretched, and, and there's so many temptations that come with it, when your faith is being stretched, the temptation, you know, to quit, or we'll talk about those in a sec, but when it's being stretched, Stop. God, you are my good shepherd. Amen. You, are, you are my shepherd and I cling to you. Like, in fact, I'm just going to chill like a sheep. <laughs> right? Aren't she, are sheep dumb? Sheep are basically not the smartest animals, I'll say that. Is that safe? I am the worst animal educationist person ever. In fact, I intentionally left Ollie out of my sermon. He's the, this is the only sermon that he doesn't make it into, and now he just did. Well, he's an example of my faith growing. Anyway, we won't go there. But how comforting is that to think like, Again, I don't have to rely on my own strengths, my own gifts, my own awareness, my own biblical theology or any of that stuff. I'm just a sheep, and he's my shepherd. Obviously, I'm so much more than that, but how simple does God make it here? Like, hey, he makes you lie down in green pastures. He leads you to places where your soul is going to be refreshed and replenished. He, like, let's remember our relationship here. We will not accomplish his plan by sheer human effort. God is the master planner, so rest in that, knowing that he's the leader and I'm the follower. I'm not a co-leader, I'm the follower. God knew us intimately, he had a plan, so we got that down. Here's another one. God is the vine and I'm the branch. Have you all ever uh, looked up the, a literal grapevine, and they kind of, they grow the vines in a horizontal fashion, and then the branches, if you just picture like a barbed wire fence or something, they grow horizontal, and then the branches just kind of fall down a little bit and bear fruit. They bear grapes, at least the one I saw recently on YouTube. And it was not from an influencer. That, no, I'm just kidding. But he's the vine, and I'm the branch. And so, and, and let's read this. So, I, did I even give you this? I don't think I did. But Jesus said, uh, my father is the gardener. I'm the vine and you're the branch. If you remain in me and I in you, then you'll produce much fruit. But apart from me, God will cut off those who are apart from me, but he'll prune those who bear fruit so that you'll bear more fruit, right? But the picture here is, again, relationship. Like, who am I in, the, in life's hard things? Who am I? I'm a branch, and all I have to do is remain in him. And what will happen? What will happen when I remain? Fruit. And fruit is good things. Good things will come as a result of my life. Good things, like, I don't know, maybe people will be born again. Good things. Maybe my children will learn about God and encounter him. Good things. Maybe I'll have a house that's full of peace and love and joy, good things, and so much more than that. But to remember the relationship here, uh, what I'm trying to get rid of in this part of the message is this m mindset of uh, extreme ownership, like I'm responsible, which is a great book, obviously, when it comes to being responsible and waking up and dis daily disciplines and all that stuff. Team building, yes. But I'm trying to get rid of the extreme ownership of this is my life 
I own it. I own the fruit of it. I own the decisions of it. I own the plan of it. I own the five-year plan. The, all these things that we just read and learned, God's the master planner. And he has a plan for my life. And uh, I just have to follow it. And, and if, I, if I seek to uncover his plan for my life, I'm going to uncover a plan that is going to prosper me. And I'm going to uncover a plan that he wants to use me for his glory. And by the way, that can be in the realm of construction and dentist office and real estate and the school and the auto care industry and the church and daycare, like wherever. Ministry, occupational ministry is not any higher of a thing or a more an admirable purpose. What is the highest purpose is God's individual purpose for your life. And, and you could be pulling shots in a cafe and simultaneously doing homeschool, and that might be God's perfect plan for your life. All right. Okay, so the branches, are they responsible to find their nourishment? You have to find your nourishment by remaining connected, but you are not responsible to produce the fruit. All right. Um, When it comes to sheep, I also remember this passage. When Jesus came, I I think he was coming down from a mountain or he saw a group of people coming down from a hillside and he was grieved. And do you remember he said, because it was like seeing sheep without a shepherd. And he was grieved because they were like people without having care and guidance. Those are kind of the main, obviously a shepherd does so much more than that. Uh, Care, guidance, nourishment. But just imagine separating yourself from the shepherd. The sheep separating from the shepherd, mangy, lifeless, in danger, right? So... Just stay with the shepherd. All right. Here's some other things, some other uh, aspects of my identity. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Remember, a disciple is a a student and also an emulator. So as a disciple of Jesus, I am seeking to emulate Jesus. I'm seeking to actually mimic his behaviors. How did Jesus model a Christian life? We can see very clearly in the Bible uh, passages that we've been reading as a church, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we see how did Jesus live his life? You know, all I have to do, try to model it. Do what Jesus did, right? That's what a disciple does. They learn and then they uh, emulate. I'm also a follower of Jesus. I'm not a leader of Jesus. I'm a follower. And I love how Jesus had followers who were just like basic people, just like every fisherman and tax collectors and whatever, like just follow. Like he didn't pick the maybe the most highly esteemable civilians of the day or whatever, you know, it, it, just normal people, like, all, you know, people, people that can follow a person. I'll put it that way. Every one of us know how to follow a person. Because every one of you got into this room somehow for the first time, and you probably followed a person in here because you saw where the door was, and you saw a per- You know how to follow people, so I'll shut up on that. Okay, I'm also a friend of Jesus. He said, I no longer call you servants, but friends, because I don't hide anything from you. I'm telling you everything the Father tells me. Isn't that awesome? I'm a friend of his. That means I have... A, a secret passcode into the Lord Jesus, like secret God code. Like other people maybe don't have that because they're not a friend of Jesus yet. You know, once they accept that invitation, they'll get the secret passcode, the Wi Fi password, if you will. But I'm a friend. He's my friend. And, and I don't mean to casually say homie to diminish him. Absolutely not. But he is my friend. Like, he loves me like a friend, and I'm not some slave who's being slave-driven by my master Jesus to go do this and do that. Yes, he's my Lord, too. 
And yes, my life is to follow him and to please him and to serve him. But he also says, Jake, you're my friend. And I want to show you things. I don't want to tell you things straight from heaven. So how does that equip me to fight the fights that I fight very well? All of that is identity. And, and lastly, I'm a member of the body of Christ united with other believers. This should not be, this can't be overstated. I'm a member of of the body of Christ, I am united with each and every one of you guys. I'm united with you. And what is the power of this body? I can't sit here and describe it all, but here is some of it. We are to bear each other's burdens. We are to encourage one another. We are to strengthen each other. We are to come in and pray for one another. And we're to lay hands on each other. And we're to sit and have coffee and have a God talk. And just check in on each other. We're the body. We're connected. And you know what happens? Um, Pastor Nate was recently teaching on this, being disconnected. You know what happens with disconnection? There's no life flow, right? But, But in the body, there's a life flow. And I know there's a huge move uh, right now culturally to home churches and these types of things. Or, man, keep gathering. Keep gathering. Just like COVID proved that online church, it's a nice supplement, but it's not a replacement for this. And we all, did we all not learn that through experience? We all learn that. And the same is going to be true of this other movement. This, this is the church right here. This is the church. And, and God has appointed pastors and teachers and prophets and these things for what? For the building up or the perfecting of the saints. This is not going away. Keep gathering. Keep this a priority. Because again, this is also where that fuel for your fight is going to come from. Try try fighting on your own. Try getting jumped in an alley five guys to one. Try that. It will not go well. You can find enough footage of that on YouTube too. (laughs) All right, so count it joy. So we can be joyful in the waiting. Count it joy when you fall into divers temptations, which is trials of any kind. Count it joy, knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, so you'll be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. That's where we're getting to, perfect and entire, lacking nothing, how? It's through the, how do you get there through the trials? And you go through, we go through trials every day, all the time, little to big to massive, right? So if any of you have ever been through a massive <clears throat> trial, it weighs on you a little more than the little stuff. But the process is the same. We can count it joy. We can count it joy. So we can be joyful in the waiting because we know who we belong to. It's someone who is at work to personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever. I'm going to read this wordy passion uh, verse passage as just really quickly. If you bow low in God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you as you leave the timing in his hands. Pour out all your worries and stress upon him and leave them there, for he always, always tenderly cares for you. Be well-balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around incessantly like a roaring lion looking for its prey to devour. Take a decisive stand against him and resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. For you know that your believing brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing the same kinds of troubles you endure. And then, everyone say, and then... After your brief suffering, the God of all loving grace who has called you to share in his eternal glory in Christ, this is my favorite part, will personally and powerfully restore you. God himself will personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever. Yes, he will set you firmly in place and build you up. That's the passion 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10. Write that down. Memorize it. It's so good. He's going to personally and powerfully restore you. When? After you do these other things. Knowing. Knowing this. 
So you can be joyful. Here's how you can hear you. be joyful knowing the devil is opposing you. Isn't that joyful? So you can rejoice. You know why that's exciting? Because the opposition is confirmation that you're headed down the right path. You've got a word from God. You've got a word from God. And you know what? He's going to fight you on that word. He's here to oppose that word. Why? Because we know the word from God is meant to prosper you and glorify God. So we can be joyful. Thank you, Lord. I've got confirmation right here. The enemy is coming at me for taking this word that I got. This word that says to do this or, or to ramp up or to trade my mornings for prayer or to, do, to teach my kids devotions, to be in church Wednesdays and Sunday, whatever it is. Whatever is the word of God to you, the devil's going to oppose it. Oh, you're now so much more busy than you were before once you committed to go to church. I wonder why. Once you committed to start giving and tithing consistently, I wonder, I wonder why all of a sudden we had a money fight. I wonder. I wonder why. We know Satan's destiny, don't we? We, we had a God talk the other night, and my son was asking about the destiny of Satan. Not his words, but mine. And so we read, you know, about the thousand-year thing, and then how there's, uh, he's going to be locked up for that. And then it says, you know, he's set free for a moment, and there's this big battle. And then he's like, and then what happens? I'm like, then he's locked up for good. And so we know Satan's destiny. And so I can be joyful knowing your opposition right now is just because you know your time is short. And you're trying, but you're not going to win in this. Hey, and by the way, I already know what happened with your past, and I already know what's going to happen with your future. Your past is you made the biggest mistake in all of eternity, and it can't be undone. Your future is you suck. <laughs> so rejoice, knowing this, right? Rejoice. I can also rejoice because, let's see, it says in 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering that, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. Be very glad. Be also very glad for what we read in James, knowing this, that the trying of your faith. And so what's happening here is my faith has a chance to grow. And, and it says in one translation, so let it grow. So let it grow. How? By hanging on to your faith, by hanging on to your word. The moment trials hit is going to be the moment you see, do you have a word? Do you have a word to hang on to? And if not, guess what? You can go get a word. Go get your word for that trial. Go get it and get it in your heart and get it in your mouth. All right. Kind of skipping through some stuff here. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We can also be joyful in serving. You know, there's something about getting your eyes off of yourself when you're going through it, isn't there? When you're going through something, you can get your eyes off yourself and over onto somebody else. A couple weeks ago, Kylie led our staff prayer in that way. She said, hey, we're going to do it this way. We're going to get our eyes onto our body. And so we, you start doing that, and it's like all of a sudden, all the cares that you thought you had, all the little things, the, the static in the mind, the stuff, it just goes away, doesn't it? As you put your eyes and your focus on, how can I minister to others right now? How can I serve others? So that's another way to find joy in that season Man, ramp up your serving. Ramp up your service to the Lord. Also, okay, last part here. So the trying of your faith works. It produces patience. 
So James 1, 4 in the New Living, it says, So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So let it grow. The act of patience is to reap blessings, reward, and renewed strength in your life. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I love the wording there, let your heart take courage. I think ever since 2020, our world has been robbed of courage. Have you noticed that? Like, it's it's so much hesitancy now. So much, eh, not so sure, so much calculating. Did you see even the storm predictions last night? Oh, Little Rock is had this thing, and, and so, ah, have you guys noticed that? Let your heart take courage. We need to get courage back in our heart, don't we? To, you know what I started doing? Keeping a log. How was I courageous today? How did I take a bold step today? Because I've noticed I've gotten pretty stinking complacent, pretty reserved, pretty risk averse. And it's funny, and God's like, new season. And so it's like, all right, take courage. Be still. Know that I'm God. Let your heart take courage. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. If we do not lose heart. If we do not lose heart. What have you lost heart of in your life? Or have you just kind of quit looking ahead and, and believing God for those things that are right in front of you that he's actually put you jurisdiction over? You have jurisdiction in your family, don't you? You have jurisdiction of your finances you, or stewardship, right, of your job. How, how's the vision of your job? How is it, are you showing up like, I'm serving this place as unto the Lord. And, and let's see the vision grow. And let's see the plan flourish. And let's see how we can use these gifts and talents to bring more success to whoever, wherever you're employed, right? Or what about your service to the church? Have we gotten casual in that? Like, let's partner with the vision. Let's be courageous, And let's kick back these thoughts of, oh, it's risky, right? Take a risk. Take a jump. Take a jump. We're jumping. All right, James 5, 7, 7 through 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth? Be patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Hang on one sec. Let me just make sure my thoughts are straight on this. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk about that and... I'm not much of a gardener, but we did do a garden last year with Pastor Nate and Evan. That was a blessing, and our kids got to learn about that. But I just love, I love the analogy of that with the plants and being patient. You know that the seed is in the ground. You know that it's at work. But the farmer, he doesn't just leave it, turn his back to it. He's going to tend it. He's going to tend it, and he's going to tend it. And in due season, he's going to reap. He doesn't get to control when the fruit comes, but he does get to control his stewardship of that word, just like we get to control our stewardship. We get to steward the word that God has given us. Amen? Amen. All right, we can, we can wrap up here, Rodney. So I want to encourage us at the close here. There's a, there's a whole laundry list of things that are going to, that try to get us to quit, to quit on the word that God has given us. 
And quitting can just simply look like complacency. Quitting can look like apathy. And I think we we are all self-aware enough to know, when have I gotten apathetic? Where have I kind of just taken my foot off the gas pedal? And things are good enough. Things are going. They're fine. But that's exactly what the devil would want us to do. Because apathy is what's going to keep us from inheriting the promises of God. We're going to inherit them through faith and patience. And patience, this patience isn't sitting back in, in the lawn chair. Patience is, I'm watching over it. I'm taking steps because I'm, I'm anticipating this thing, whatever is the word that I'm standing on and stewarding. I, I know it's going to come about. I'm patiently expecting it. So, watch out for apathy and complacency. Watch out for temptation to quit on the promise. Watch out for the temptation to decrease in your church attendance. Especially with, you know, sports. Baseball is right around the corner, right? The summer slump, a lot of churches call it, right? Watch out for that. That's exactly what the enemy would want us to do is to disconnect and to decrease that life flow. Watch out for complaining. Watch out for complaining when you're being stretched, when you come home and there's tacos on the floor because Ollie helped himself. Because did, did complaining keep the Israelites out of the promised land? Absolutely. It says in the word, they grumbled in their tents. Can anyone relate to that, minus the tent? Yeah? They grumbled in their car on the way home. How about that? Anybody? Watch out for that. Watch out for this. Uh, birthing an Ishmael. Abraham. They, they thought, I'm so old, I, I'm not going to see the promise of God, my son. And so let's just do it in our own strength. And so for you who are waiting and, and patiently anticipating and watching over whatever is that word or that promise that God has given you, watch out for, I'm just, I'm just going to do it myself. Like, I did that just recently. Like, okay, God, I know you're calling us, and I'm a calculated guy, so I like to know where you're calling us to. And God's like, I know you're a calculated guy. And that's why I'm saying you need to take the jump. And, and so he was faithful to show us where, but we're still waiting on some stuff. We're still waiting on some answers. And you know what it's doing to us? I trust you, God. I trust you. And so I'm like, well, I know what I can do. I know how to do videos and stuff, so I'll just go start a marketing company. And then it's like, oh, that's just a lot of striving, and I know that's not right. Okay, I'll stop that. Okay, what do you want me to do, Lord? And so we believe that he's calling us to ministry there, but we haven't heard back from them yet. But we're just, we're waiting patiently with joy. And that's okay. And this is what we're learning. And we're doing it. And this is two years in the making. But watch out for birthing an Ishmael because what you birth in your own strength, you have to maintain in your own strength. What you birth in your own strength, you have to provide for in your own strength. You want that nice, big, brand new house, and you're just sick of waiting on it, so you're just, by God, we're just going to do it. And I don't even know how it's going to work, but I just think we're going to do it. Well, is he leading you to do that and take that step of faith? Cool. Or is that you getting frustrated that it's taking so long? Maybe we need to back up and say, okay, it's taking a minute. So God, show me and dedicate yourself to study the word. How can, I, how can I be faithful in this season to steward this word? What's coming out of my mouth? What's in my heart? Take an take a inventory of those things and do a, a heart check, a status check. But don't birth an Ishmael. Watch out for that. Watch out for complaining. Watch out for the victim mindset, which says... Complaining, it's a fixed mindset, it's blaming others, and it's focusing on the problem. The victor is going to focus on the solution, 
It's going to say, God, how can I be responsible and steward well right now? How can I grow and not just stay fixed? And how can I take action instead of complaining? Victim, victor. Watch out for the victim mindset. All of this, I think God, what he's doing is he's developing in us strong spirits for what's ahead. There's amazing things ahead for this body, for you personally. Amazing things ahead. Growth happens after stretching, doesn't it? Stretching produces growth. It does that in the gym. It does that in your faith. It does that in other things. I'm not going li- to make a huge list. Anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. Anyway, anyway, so thank you, Lord. We're going to count it all joy, and we're going to do what you showed us in your word, and we're going to be strengthened, and we're going to inherit the promises that you've given us, and my spirit man is growing, and I'm so excited about that. Are you excited? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to gather as a church family and as a listener, and I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is and was present tonight. And let the Word of God be planted on good soil. And we will watch over it. We realize that we can watch over that seed. And we will. Father, I just ask you to to do an amazing work in all of the people here that this seed would bear fruit the fruit of strength and stamina and endurance and victory and rejoicing and joy. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I dismiss, just a reminder about Easter. Ask the Lord, who can you text? Who can you invite to Easter? It's going to be an amazing uh, amazing service this Sunday. See you all there.